Okay, so the climate in the past was different. Okay, we have an idea from, I guess, you know, popular media that, you know, it was colder in the, the recent past. You know, we had mammoths, you know, roaming around, being all woolly and kind of like mammothy. Um, and, you know, when the dinosaurs were around, you know, we have an idea that, you know, at least sometime during that, you know, it was a bit warmer. But, you know, how do we know? You know, how do we find out what the climate was like in the past? Okay. So this, uh, this, this lecture will be about, you know, where are the lines of evidence that we, uh, that we use um, to tell out these things. Um, so before we talk about uh, the past climate, okay, we need to first of all get an idea of how we know about the past climate because uh, the Earth is very old uh, and we have not been on it for a very long time uh, and therefore there are not records where people have written down, oh, in the Cretaceous it was a bit warm uh, and it was rainy on Tuesdays. Uh, so we need to use uh, these things called proxies so the word proxy is just an indirect measurement of something. Okay, so in the geological context, it's these things, but you can have proxy measurements of all kinds of things and all kinds of other things. So uh, you can have proxy votes when you have an election, which is basically an indirect measurement of your voting intention, um, usually by your oppressive spouse in the 70s. Um, but uh, in, in, in geology, in geosciences, we use basically rocks and things we find in rocks or sediments to tell us about the past. So there are, there are a bunch of different classes of types of proxies. So things like lithological information. Okay, so you can look at the type of rock that you find, usually sedimentary rock, and you can say, well, what kind of environment does that rock form in, or would have formed in? Uh, so for instance, uh, most of you guys went to the um, Earth Dynamics field trip to Pease Bay. There was like a red sandstone at the end of the beach think, well, that would have formed in some kind of desert environment. Okay, So we can infer that that time uh, the climate was warm and dry. Uh, we can also use biological information. So usually this takes the form of fossils, but in kind of more recent deposits, so kind of maybe in peat bog cores, things like that, we can actually use uh, the actual still like, biological living, not living remains because they're dead, but things like beetles and uh, plant remains. Um, uh, so the assemblage that we might find, so if we might find a group of animals or a group of fossil plants that are characteristic of a warm environment, uh, we would say it's warm. Or if it's a cold environment, it's cold. Um, we can also use information about the individual fossils, so particularly with fossil leaves. So if you can find some fossil leaves, if you look at a leaf under a microscope, it's got made of lots of individual cells of kind of, you know, plant cell. But some of those cells have got a hole in Okay, it's not actually the cell, so there's two cells next to each other and there's a hole in the middle. And these are the tiny holes which, through which a plant breathes. Okay? Uh, they're called stomata, uh, for presumably the Greek for little hole. Um, and uh, it turns out that the density, the number of, of these little holes on a leaf, okay, is related to the atmospheric CO2 content. And there's various kind of arguments why that would be the case. But we can basically just count the number of holes in a leaf, and we can work out the past carbon dioxide content. So we've got a proxy measurement for a direct kind of climate-related kind of environmental parameter there. So as well as biological information, we can have chemical information. So these are things like actually finding a fossil that's made out of some kind of mineral, so usually calcium carbonate or uh, opal or some, something that's kind of like nice and solid, um, and we can measure the chemical composition of that. Okay, so either maybe the, the amount of magnesium or calcium in calcite, or quite often we use these uh, measurements of oxygen isotopes, which will come up a lot in uh, both geology, environmental geoscience, all kinds of courses like that. So isotopes are used a lot, um, uh, and they can, uh, they can tell us about... Um, sorry. Um, they can tell us a lot about the environment in which that, that mineral was precipitated. Okay, so we don't need to worry about too much of the details, I'll just go through that quickly, but... Um, right. Um, uh, but, but, but basically you can measure the chemistry of stuff and that tells you about things. So kind of that's a, kind of like a really straightforward summary of that. Um, okay, so uh, some quick examples of climate sensitive rock types. So if you find a coral reef, a fossil coral reef, you could say, well, coral reefs nowadays, they grow in warm, tropical kind of like places. So we can say, well, probably a warm kind of tropical place. It's not necessarily true, okay, so it might be that different kinds of corals that lived in deep geological time kind of survived under different environmental conditions, 
Okay, so it might be that because corals in the past could have survived from cold water. So we need to be a bit cautious. This is kind of this yeah but part of the argument. Okay, so we say found a coral reef, therefore it was warm here back when this coral reef was growing. Okay, but there's an assumption we're making that the types of corals in the past lived in the same kind of environment as uh, the corals in the future. It's kind of the theory of uniformitarianism, which you might have come across in Earth Dynamics. Anyway, right, right. So uh, if you find windblown deposits, that indicates it's arid, because if it's wet, you get soils develop, and kind of um, uh, that stops the sand blowing around. Okay, and, and similarly, you might say, yeah, but, but maybe in the deep geological past, before land plants evolved, okay, sediment on the surface of the earth would be blown around if it's wet or dry. This needs to be dry for a few days for stuff to blow around. So, um, so these are kind of like broad brush, you know, find coral reefs, it's warm, find sand dunes, it was kind of dry and windy, okay. Find coal deposits, that's usually an indicator of the climate being kind of like warm. Uh, if you find glacial deposits, so either you know, eroded landscapes by a glacier or some of the, the mud and rock that's deposited by glaciers, that's you know indicator that it's cold. And if you find evaporites, it must have been warm enough to evaporate the water. Pretty, pretty standard stuff. Um, there's a little caveat, an, an, issue, an additional caveat to that, in that the climate, as we saw yesterday, is not the same all around the whole globe. Okay, so different parts of the Earth have got different kind of environmental conditions. And these are kind of, I think this is just, uh, uh, all these colours are basically different classifications of the climate. Okay, so you have desert climates, which are red, you have kind of uh, maritime um, temperate climates, which are the green, that's where we are. You have tundra, which is this kind of like grey stuff at the top. Lots of different kinds of environment, which will produce different kinds of rocks. So if you find a rock at any one site and you say, well, I found myself a rock that's very typical of a desert, uh, does that mean that the whole planet was dry and hot? Okay? No, it just means that you might have found a rock that happened to have been deposited around the equator, okay? which is kind of the warm dry bit. Um, so you need, to, you need to worry about that spatial distribution. So for instance, if you go to, and some of you, many of you will be going to... Um, Arthur's Seat at the weekend, and you may see some kind of sedimentary rocks there that might have some fossils in them that might indicate that it was a kind of like a, a coaly kind of swampy area in the Carboniferous, okay? And that's what the Carboniferous is known for, okay? It's known for, in the UK particularly, having lots and lots of swampy deposits, coals, shallow marine, so very warm, very humid. But it turns out that globally, the climate in the Carboniferous was much, much colder than... Than, than other times. So the rock is telling us kind of like warm and wet, but actually the global climate at the time is um, uh, not. Okay? So you need to worry about the spatial distribution of your proxy sampling. Okay? So you need to think about, you know, I've, I've found this, 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 I've measured the past temperature and kind of wetness, but I need to know, you know, where was that geographically? Was this rock formed at the equator? Was it formed? Holes before you can say anything about the global climate. Okay. Um, so another kind of the thing that quite a lot of uh, geoscientists do is they um, drill or they take uh, gravity cores uh, into the ocean. So this is basically a long hollow tube with a big weight on the end. You drop it onto the seafloor and it brings you back a nice core that's filled with mud. This is a core filled with mud. These are scientists. Um, and that gives you basically a continuous record of stuff that's been formed or blown into the ocean, okay, and deposited in layers in the sediment. Okay? This is really annoying. Um, maybe a little bit less feedback. Okay. So we can we can basically get a record of climate from this mud by picking out things in that mud that tell us about the past climate. So uh, some of these things are microfossils, so we've got uh, Planktonic foraminifera, diatoms. Uh, this is uh, a plate from a coccolithophore. These, are, I mean, these are all terms that don't really matter at the moment, but uh, they're um, they're basically little bits of plankton that grow shells. Okay, we don't call them shells, so they call them tests or things like that. But um, and we can look at um, well, we move on and we can look at. 
So if we find different species of these things in our fossil record, so these are two kinds of uh, foraminifera with really unpronounceable Neoglobuquadrina pachyderma dextral and the, uh, that long word sensual. So basically two <coughs> morphologies of, of, uh, of um, foram and each one lives in a different environment. So one of them likes cold water, one of them likes warm water. So if you find these in your sediment core, you can basically count how many of one type and how many of the other type you've got. Okay? If you find lots of warm ones, or ones that like living in warm water, you could say, in the past, the, 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 the water above my core site was warm. Okay? And, you can, and what the bottom is here, this is, this is a proxy calibration study. Okay? So this is where people have been out into the North Atlantic, and they've gone to places in the North Atlantic that, that the water is lots of different temperatures. So they go to the far, they go to the far North Atlantic where it's really, really cold. Okay, and they go to the kind of like slightly more equatorial North Atlantic where it's a bit warmer. And they take a sediment core and they get the sediment off the surface of that core and they count the, 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 the fossils in that. And they find that when it's cold, okay, they find mostly uh, the uh, lefty coiling ones. Okay, you can see kind of they, they coil in a, in a different direction. And when you go to warm water, you find mostly the righty coiling ones. Okay. So the things about this, this allows you to then go into a, uh, a, a down the core to times in the past. Okay, you measure the ratio of these two things, and you kind of see if you find maybe you've got 60% one, 40% the other, you can read across here and work out what the temperature was. Okay? So this is great, okay, but a calibration like this does have some weaknesses. So this is part of the, the yeah but. I mean this is great, but is it is it fantastic? So if we go to if we find 100% right coiling four amps, okay, that means that we know that it's eh, maybe 16 degrees or above, okay? So the proxy is saturated, okay? We can't tell how much warmer it is above that, that particular temperature. Likewise, if we find all lefties, okay, we can say it's cold, but we can't say if it's like two degrees or minus two degrees, okay? Um, so that's one of the problems, the proxy saturates. Another one is that we are assuming that this relationship between um, the type of foram you get and the temperature is the same throughout all of geological time. Okay? And this, this kind of behavior, or this preference for um, uh, the, the water temperatures between these species has evolved at some point in time. Okay? And it might be the case that that has evolved gradually through time, or suddenly, we don't really know that well. Okay, so uh, this, that's another problem with kind of proxy calibrations, is that you're calibrating them using modern conditions, but you don't know if that relationship has held true over all of geological time. Okay, so uh, moving on now to some of the chemistry things. So there are these things, kind of oxygen isotopes, magnesium-calcium ratio. So if we, if we find some of these uh, shells, like we just showed you in the slide before, we can dissolve them, we can measure their isotopic composition, and their chemical composition. And it turns out we can do the same kind of proxy calibration. And these kind of type of measurements end up being proxies for things like temperature, how much ice there is on the planet, um, the salinity of the water, all kinds of different environmental parameters. Okay? So another prox problem here is that, for instance, for magnesium calcium, if we, if we measure the magnesium calcium ratio of the calcium carbonate, okay, so it's not just calcium carbonate, it has a little bit of magnesium in it, that that ratio of magnesium to calcium changes with temperature. So at warmer temperatures, you have more magnesium incorporated into the calcite structure. But it also, so we, so we, could, we could make measure that magnesium calcium and we say, oh, we can predict what the temperature is. But there are other environmental parameters that also affect the, 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 the chemical composition of the shell. So the carbonate ion concentration, the salinity of the water, the actual chemistry of the water that the, the thing is precipitating out from that also changes. So that's some problems with this um, chemistry techniques. Um, and then, again, here we've got another problem, another yeah, but is kind of seasonal bias. So if we've got our sediment core, and that's got a whole bunch of kind of fossil plankton in it, what time during the year, and we, we, we measure some proxy for temperature, what time during the year do you think that, that re basically reflects? 
because plankton is not constantly being produced in the water column. Okay? It is constantly being produced and falling out of the bottom. But at some times of the year, more of it is being produced than other times of the year. So during the spring and the late summer, we have big production of, uh, of uh, basically life in the ocean. We have these blooms of plankton. Lots and lots of them are produced. So if we just did the average of all of our measurements, it wouldn't give us the annual average temperature. It would give us some bias towards the season at which our organisms grew in. Okay, so that's another little problem that we need to think about and whether that changes through time as well. And it's this proxy calibration consistency that we've just talked about previously. Okay, so I guess this is just a quick, um, just a quick thing to just to introduce you to this concept of oxygen isotopes. They'll come up a lot in graphs and stuff like that. But basically, uh, oxygen, the element that makes up you know, quite a lot of things like water and um, it's in calcium carbonate as well. So the element oxygen has a number of different isotopes. So same chemistry, different mass of the atoms. So one's got a mass of 16, one's got a mass of 17, one's got a mass of 18. And it turns out that you might have been taught in school that Isotopes of the same element behave chemically identically, okay? And it turns out that that's not true, okay? They have slightly different bond strengths. So that means that when, when, when chemistry happens to them, okay, they slightly, some, some of the isotopes prefer to go into the product, some stay in the, 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 um, the reactants of equation of, 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 of chemical reactions. Um, so that it turns out that, that you do see very small differences in the ratios of each isotope in kind of geological materials. And we, and we, we measure that and describe it in this, this, this terminology here, which is um, uh, this thing. So this is a Greek letter delta, okay? So we basically describe the, the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 relative to some standard, okay? So it doesn't actually matter what this standard is. So this is not basically the apps. It's, you can think of this number as the rate that how much oxygen 18 you've got in your sample relative to how much oxygen 16, okay? But it's not an absolute ratio, it's just relative to some arbitrary standard, okay? So when this number is a positive number, okay, uh, it's, uh, we've got more oxygen 18, and when it's a negative number, we've got less oxygen 18 than we would normally have, okay? And you can see this times a thousand, means that these, these differences, basically we have to times it by a thousand to make these differences sensible numbers. These are really small variations in the amount of one isotope and the other. Okay, so just as an example of what happens, um, so uh, when, when water evaporates, okay, uh, water is made up of one oxygen and two hydrogen ions, so if you have a water molecule that's got an oxygen 16 in it and a water molecule that's got an oxygen 18 in it, okay, the molecule that's got the 18 in it will be heavier. Yeah? Okay. Uh, it will also uh, be moving around in the water more slowly okay, because it's got a greater mass. So for the same energy, the oxygen 16 will be moving around faster. Which means that when that water evaporates, it's easier for the oxygen 16 to get out of the water. Okay? So that means the ocean has got more oxygen 18 in it than the atmosphere. So water vapour in the atmosphere. Okay? So that means that when you precipitate out that water on ice sheets, you're preferentially removing the oxygen 16 and storing it on land. Okay? So when we have more... Um, uh, when we have more ice on Earth, the ocean becomes preferentially positive for delta 18O. Okay? Um, and there's also an effect that if you precipitate carbonate out of seawater, okay, the, um, the uh, carbonate preferentially has the oxygen 18 in it. Okay? And that, that preference becomes greater at colder temperatures. Okay? This means that if you've got fossils that have grown in seawater, when it's cold and there's lots of ice on the continents, we'll have a more positive delta 18O. But when it's warm and there's not lots of ice, we'll have a negative delta 18O. Okay? Um, and oh, see, just to point out that geologists do this really annoying thing by, by flipping axes 
both the age axis and the, and the up and down axis. So quite often, you'll see oxygen isotopes plotted where negative is up on the graph and positive is down. Okay, so just be aware of that. And quite often in geology, time is the wrong way. We'll go on to that when we see a time graph. Okay, so another, another kind of proxy, well, it's not so much a proxy, is that we can get information from ice. So this is part of an ice cap. Uh, I think in Antarctica, and you can see the, uh, the snow was built up in layers. And we can go dig down through that either with a core or with a shovel, and we can, we can look at both uh, the composition of the water or the composition of the ice crystals, uh, and that will tell us things uh, about, um, we can measure the chemistry of those, and that might tell us things about the temperature in which that, that snow was precipitated. Uh, we can also look at actual bubbles of the fossil atmosphere that have been trapped in that ice. Okay, so this isn't actually a proxy. These are direct measurements of the past atmosphere. Um, and we can also look at other things that are caused in the ice as well, things like uh, grains of dust. So if you have more dust in the ice sheets, that might indicate the globe more generally is a more dry and windy place because more dust is being blown into places like Antarctica. Okay, and these are, these are, these are cores. This is what they, when you drill into an ice, you kind of like get big long tubes of ice. There we go. That's pretty nice. um, and similarly, you can drill into trees. Uh, it does do quite bad things to the tree when you drill into it. Um, uh, and we can get information about climate from trees. Okay, because these grow with annual layers, and the thickness of that annual layer tells us something about the environmental conditions that tree grew under. So when you get a thick ring, that might mean that it was maybe warmer. So more photosynthesis could go on, or it was maybe wetter, so more photosynthesis could go on. So with tree uh, ring um, data, it's quite hard to tell the difference between whether you get a, a big ring, whether that year was a warm year or a wet year. Okay? And in different parts of the world, these things matter differently, and they matter differently for different kinds of trees. But if you make enough measurements over a big enough area, you can build up actually quite a very accurate um, uh, proxy reconstruction of past temperature and precipitation. And there's a picture of a tree. Um, and I guess finally, you know, trees grow in annual layers. We get information about climate from those layers. And other things also grow in annual layers. So I think this is a picture of our head of department, uh, Sandy Tudhope, uh, drilling, into a, uh, it, it, uh, drilling into a large porites coral. Uh, coral was fine. Um, and that drill course, this is an x-ray of that core. You can see that there is growing in annual layers here. And what we can do is we can measure maybe the thickness of those layers, the density of the carbonates, and that tells us something about the conditions in which that, that coral grew. We can also measure some of these chemical proxies, so the oxygen isotopes, the uh, strontium-calcium ratio in this case. We can measure magnesium-calcium, it really tells us much for corals. Um, uh, we can also look at things like some of the organic compounds. So this is how much fluorescence there is in this this sample, that tells us some about uh, how, that, uh, how that coral is feeding. Okay, so there's lots of information that we can get out of these. This is really annoying. Um, anyway. So, I mean, to, as a cartoon summary, we can go, go, kind of go back in time. Right. Sorry. Is that still... So I'll just shout more. I guess that'll be nice. Um, we can go back in time and measure stuff in things that tell us about other um, kind of environmental parameters. So we, we measure proxies and they tell us something about the past environment. And if we know when those were, we can get some kind of curve that tells us about how climate has changed through time. So just as a little pointer, um, figuring out this thing is also important. Okay, so figuring out how old things are is just as important as figuring out when the climate or what state the climate was in. And there are a whole bunch of different ways that we can go about dating things. So we can use uh, radioactive techniques. Uh, so for instance, if we've got stuff that's... Um, oh, so basically, uh, with, with these kind of uh, measurements, we basically get a sample that's from our deposit. We measure its, uh, some of its radioactive elements, and those can tell us how old it is. But um, we need to be quite careful with uh, some of these um, things like... Uh, radiocarbon measurements, it's got a half-life, the radiocarbon carbon-14 has a half-life of just under 6,000 years, 
So if you if you if you you were trying to reconstruct the climate from samples that were maybe a million years old, this would be a useless technique because all of the ready carbon would have decayed away. Um, so if you've got really old stuff, you have to use elements that have got longer half-lives, say rubidium and strontium, it's got a half-life of 47 billion years, which is longer than the age of the universe. Um, so you could use that to tell you about kind of things that are in the older end of geological time. Uh, uranium and lead, uh, they kind of pretty much cover the whole range of, um, of geological time. But you have to have a sample that has uranium and lead in it. Okay, so you couldn't, for instance, date fossil charcoal very well, which is made out of carbon with uh, uranium and lead, because that doesn't incorporate any uranium into its kind of like structure. Okay, you can use that with kind of things like volcanic ashes. They kind of have minerals in that you can use those kind of things. So you need to think about: Does the thing I'm dating have these radioactive elements in to start with, and is it of an appropriate age to use that geochronology tool? So there are. There are other ways of, of, of putting ages on things as well, and there's this kind of concept of relative dating. So in this case, uh, you might have one climate record. So for instance, this is a speleothem. This is my friend Kathleen drilling into a speleothem. So this is kind of like a stalagmite. And we can, we can because a stalagmite is made out of calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate incorporates little bits of uranium when it first forms. We can use radioactive decay of that uranium into either lead or into thorium, and that will tell us how old this thing is, right? Okay, so we can use that, and we can measure the isotopic composition of that, that's in red here, okay, and that tells us something about the climate under which this speleothem grew in. So we've got the age, and we've got an estimate of the climate from where this grew, but what if we wanted to know something about this sediment core? So this is Jim Zakos, who's a big cheese in paleoceanography, and this is a sediment core. It's actually a model of a sediment core, but anyway. Um, and it's actually really hard to date sediment cores. So you can't use these dating techniques of uh, radioactive decay very well to date sediment cores, particularly very old. So you can do radiocarbon on sediment cores, because um, you can date some of the young fossils. But if you want to date some old stuff, you can't. So what, what you can do is you can basically just measure the proxy in this core, okay? And you can measure the proxy in this uh, speaking of them here. And that's what's in this figure at the top. So the black curve is the proxy of measuring the sediments, and the um, red is the proxy measured in the speaking of them. And you know, basically, you just match up the wiggles, okay? That allows you to transfer your knowledge of age from the speaking of them onto the knowledge of the age for the um, uh, sediment core. Okay? So that's great, but we have another yeah but here in that some of this is kind of slightly subjective in that you know, the peaks look really matched, well matched up now, but in, other, in some places in the core, for instance, ranges like this doesn't seem to match it very well. Um, we've got a peak here that we've matched up to this peak here, but what if we you know, we'd matched it to this one here, okay? So some of, picking which peak to match to which other peak is, is slightly subjective, but anyway, we, we move on. Okay, so that's just an introduction into some of the proxies we use, how we find out about past climates. So what we're going to do now is go on and look at some examples of that, and the first one we're going to do is look at really long-term climate change, so over millions or tens of millions of years.